مالك يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية السيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al-Asr Wal-Zaman. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The law of blasphemy is considered one of the most controversial laws in any religion of God. You find that since time immemorial, each of God's religions has had a law in relation to blasphemy. A blasphemous statement is a statement that could result in the execution of a person in that particular state. We normally come across terminologies such as blasphemy or heresy. Blasphemy is when a person may, for example, begin by insulting God, by making fun of God, by, for example, saying that there is no God, and then spreading this belief amongst the community. Heresy, for example, is when one may have, according to some definitions, the wrong notion of what God is, and then begins to spread such a heresy. Yes, someone who, for example, may say that they are God, or for example, they may turn around and say a particular group of people are God. You find, therefore, that whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, many of them have their own laws in regards to a blasphemous statement. If you're in Jewish land, or in Christian land, or in Muslim land, each of these lands have their own laws in regards to what's a blasphemous statement, or what's sacrilege, or what leads to apostasy. In Islamic law, we have terminologies for each of these. You have, for example, Isa'a or Tajdeef, or what may lead to being a Murtad, what may lead to being an apostate. Of course, the aims of the blasphemy laws is to try and keep public order within society. We know that Islamic law seeks to preserve five important notions within society. When someone asks you, why do you have Islamic law, as in what's the aim of law, we know very well that there are many people who hate law, therefore hate religion. Many times, people say to you, I don't want religion because I don't want structure. I prefer to have my own relationship with God, for example. I don't want structured religion. Islamic law aims to protect the property of a human, the honor of a human, the intellect of a human, the life of a human, and the religion of a human. Because it believes that these five, if they are all honored, will make a peaceful and orderly society. If people's properties are secure, if people's honor are secure, if one's intellect is secure, if one's life is secure, and if one's religion is secure, then that is the best of societies. Therefore, when there's a law on blasphemy, the aim of the laws of blasphemy are to say that if a person begins to start to insult, for example, God, or to insult the Prophet of God, or, for example, to burn the Qur'an, yes? 
It's only 10 years ago when there was a group of people who burned the Quran publicly. This was seen as a blasphemous moment. Why? Because when you're burning the Quran, you're insulting God according to the religion of Islam. Some people therefore said that blasphemy is a vital component of society. That there has to be laws for blasphemy in any society. If you look for example in Pakistan, blasphemy law is of the utmost importance in Pakistani law. In Indonesia, blasphemy law is fundamental. Saudi Arabia's blasphemy laws are intense. Iran, in one way or the other, has their own notion of what is blasphemy and what's heresy. All of these countries, therefore, when they have laws for blasphemy, are claiming that they are trying to safeguard the public peace. That as long as there aren't people who are insulting what is sacrilege, you can't insult the Quran. You can't insult the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. And you cannot claim to be a Muslim if you're not a Muslim. If, for example, you maintain this, then you're maintaining the peace. The problem is when governments use this law to destroy their enemies. Yes, Because blasphemy law can be used and it can be abused. Yes. If I am the head of a government and I see you as a political threat, I'm the most powerful man in the country. But your opinions differ from mine. The easiest thing I could do is say that you insulted the Prophet Muhammad one day and get you imprisoned, can't I? Because we know very well that the majority of these countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, for example, Iran, majority of the people, their knowledge of religion is fickle. Yes. Don't imagine because these are religious countries that everyone's very religious and everyone's very knowledgeable. I guarantee you, that if you take me to a village in one of those two countries, if 90% of that village know the first 10 surahs of the Holy Quran, I'll change my name tonight. And you can pick the name as well. If you go to many of these countries, you go to Saudi Arabia or Iran, and mind you, this goes for much of the Muslim world. If you ask much of the Muslim world to name you 90% of the, the to name you 10 surahs, the first 10 of the Quran, they will not know. Say Fatiha, Baqarah, Al Imran, and then after that, Bob's your uncle. You therefore find that when you have a religion which is made up of so many followers who are knowledgeable, those followers' emotion is more important than their intellect. Yes? Because many of them start following the religion on the basis of emotion, not intellect. Yes, there is an intellectual rigor, a re appreciation of intellect, but emotion seems to be more. The moment a government wants to use and abuse blasphemy law, it can get rid of any of its opponents, yes? You find in Islamic history, numerous times, there were judges who used the law of blasphemy. How? They publicly said that this law makes the peace in our community, safeguards the interests. But when you ran against them for power, for example, you wanted to be prime minister, he wanted to be prime minister, you found that what does the government do? The government suddenly puts an accusation against that person. That person believes he is God. That person insulted God. Imagine a whole village, for example, in Iran or in India, for example, or in Somalia. Here's that somebody insulted God. Wallah, you'll find people who do not look for witnesses. They'll jump on that person and they'll destroy his skull in Pakistan a few months ago. A young man, university student, was beaten to death. Why was he beaten to death? Say that the person spoke out against the religion of Islam and against beliefs of Islam. Okay, there's a courtroom for that, yes. There's a place to go, there's a courtroom. You can't just take the law into your own hands. Therefore, the law of blasphemy is one of the most sensitive laws as well. Because if this law is used by someone who's rash, that person could end up destroying the whole of society. I remember in Indonesia, General Ahok, a Christian general in Indonesia, when it came to the election said, it is not compulsory and does it say nowhere in the Quran that a Muslim has to vote for a Muslim ahead of a non-Muslim. That was his statement. He's a Christian. He says, nowhere in the Quran is there a verse that a Muslim has to vote for a Muslim candidate ahead of a non-Muslim. He's right. The Quran does not say that a Muslim has to vote for a Muslim ahead of a non-Muslim. If I end up having to vote for a Muslim who's like Yazid bin Muawiyah and his ways, and there's a Christian like the Najashi of Ethiopia, tell me who's better than the two?
The Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kunu qawwamina bil qif. Yes. Be those who establish justice, not those who establish Islam. If there is a just candidate, you know what they did to him? They put him in prison straight away. That person turned around and said, what have I said wrong? No, he was a big candidate. So what do you do? You start saying that this Christian has blasphemed against God's word. When do you say that, Mufti X or Judge Y, when they say such a thing, will you be able to debate them? No. And if you love them and you have their picture at home on your wall, straight away you'll idolize that person. If that person says to you that such and such people are my enemies. If they're my enemies, they're the enemies of Rasulullah. Look at the emotion. Whoever's my enemy is the enemy of Rasulullah. Whoever's the enemy of Rasulullah is the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to Habibi, who puts you in the chain with the rest of these? Yes. As in, I can understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. But then who puts you as the connector? No, I'm the representative of Rasulullah on earth. That means if you insult me, where's your representation of Rasulullah? You, the mufti of so and so country. When you say that I'm the representative of Rasulullah, who puts you as the representative? If you're a judge of law, then you can play with law. Yes. You'll say that this hadith is me. Who said it's you? No, no, it's me. It's nobody else. But who said it's you? My ijtihad said it's me. Well, then if your ijtihad leads to you, then that's a circular argument. What you then find, therefore, is that blasphemy, if it is abused, it's dangerous. If it's removed, it opens the door for insults within society. Therefore, what was Islam's version of the blasphemy law? Did Islam say that blasphemy means anyone who is not a Muslim or differs with you, you must kill them? And what examples can we see in history? Because on the internet today, there's always a couple of examples of people who they say the Prophet Muhammad killed because they did not believe in his prophethood. Yes, on the internet. I find that there are a number of atheist websites. And I know that the atheist world is mainly made up of two groups of people. Those who are affected by the hypocrisy of religion. I don't blame them. Or those who may have reached their own conclusion sincerely. I can't then judge that person. That person may have reached a conclusion there's no God. I can't then judge that person. But on these websites, they always bring up the name. For example, Abdullah, the son of Khatal. Or Ka'ab, the son of Ashraf. They say, Rasulullah ordered for them to be killed. Why? Because they said he's not a prophet of God. So Rasulullah said, get a sword and behead that man. When they give us these, are we able to reply to them or no? Because if I claim my prophet is a mercy to mankind, how do I know that my prophet did not abuse the laws of blasphemy for his own sake? Yes. My prophet knows he has people who love him. He knows that he has people who jump on his wudu when his wudu comes from his face. That type of person, when you have a mob who love you, yes, as a religious man, when you have a mob that loves you, they're willing to kill other mobs. I don't want to go too sensitive on some of these issues. But in every Islamic state in the world, there's a mob. That mob, if they want to, they'll slap you. That mob, if they want to, they'll torture you in prison. The same mob, by the way, are the ones who tell you that I love Ahlul Bayt, yes. The same ones, they'll tell you that I love the Quran, I love Rasulullah. You dare to talk about one of their leaders. When you say that, they'll say to you, my prophet, when someone didn't believe in him as a prophet, he beheaded them. And likewise, my leader is the representative of that prophet. If you don't agree with him, I'm ready to come and kill you. Let's tonight examine the sensitive subjects of blasphemy in Islamic law. And seek to understand, did Rasulullah say, that anyone who disagrees with Islam go and behead them or go and shoot them? Or was his vision a much wider vision? I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Number one, which verses of the Quran highlight the world view of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family? Number two, when Ka'ab, the son of Ashraf, or Abdullah bin Khattal, when they had a difference with the Prophet, why were they killed? Was it because they did not believe in him as a prophet? Or did they break the laws of Medina at that time? Number three, if I'm a Christian living in the time of Rasulullah and I don't believe he's a prophet of God, am I to be killed or can I still go to my church? Number four, did any of the companions of the prophet become rude to him? And if they became rude to him, did he say kill them? 
Or did he say, let them continue with their freedom of thought? Yes. Number five, where can we see blasphemy being applied in Islamic history and its law? And how are two of the most important authors of Islamic law? Why were they known as Shaheed al-Awwal and Shaheed al-Thani? Number six, which Khalifa killed the lovers of Ali by arguing that they had insulted God? And how did his son use the law of blasphemy to massacre the children of Rasulullah? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When someone comes to me and says that my prophet kills those who disagree with him, which I as in the Quran do I show? It's a fundamental question because if someone looks at my prophet's biography, they'll say that the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, was a man that if you did not believe he's a prophet, he'll order his friends to come and behead you. When you look within the Quran, you find that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him's family, emerges in a society where there are people of many different beliefs. Christians in Medina believed Jesus, the Son of God. Jews believed up until Moses. They were awaiting a Messiah, but they couldn't believe the Messiah was riding a camel. They thought there would be chariots and angels. But these people were living in Medina, and many of them were the most powerful people in Medina, as in the Jewish community. Banu Nadir, for example, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Qurayza, the Jews of Fadak, the Jews of Khaybar. These were amongst the most powerful Jewish tribes you'll ever come across. They ruled Medina. And we know the Jewish community has always been known for their acumen in the world of business. Yes. In business, in Medina, nobody could mess with them. The Holy Prophet, therefore, when he came to Medina, knew that he's in a very sensitive world. A world where there are some who will reject him as a messiah. The first statement he makes upon entrance into Medina was to highlight that he will defend every synagogue, every church, and every mosque in Medina. Please understand this vital point. If the Prophet Muhammad was against you being a Christian, or against you being Jewish, for example, Yes. Then he'd order his companions. He'd say, listen, any Jew or any Christian that you find, you have to massacre them. Or any Jew or any Christian you find, you must kill them. When Abu Sufyan led the army to come and kill the Holy Prophet on the day of Badr, the Quran mentioned something fundamental. Number one, that this war at Badr is not offensive, it's defensive. Yes. Why? أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا those who have been ordered to fight have been ordered to fight because they've been oppressed. Allah will give them victory. Why have they been oppressed? Yes. They've been ordered to leave their houses for no reason. You know, they were ordered to leave Mecca to go to Medina. If you were a Muslim in Mecca, you'd be butchered. So many of them had to migrate to Medina. Then the Quran says the reason that the Holy Prophet is going to fight at Badr. You know, many people say Muhammad spread his religion by the sword, don't they? They say Muhammad, when you read his biography, all you read is Badr, Uhud, Khanda, Khaybar, sword, killing, fighting. All of these wars are defensive, not offensive. Rasulullah does not want to live in a world where he goes around killing people. Rasulullah was living in a world where they wanted his power and prestige. So they were fighting him. But the Quran said the reason why he was fighting was not just to preserve Islam. Someone would think the Prophet Muhammad, when he fights, is only to protect the religion of Islam. The Quran says, Listen to this verse. Chapter 22 from verse 39 and 40 says that the reason our Prophet is fighting is to defend every church, synagogue, mosque and monastery in Arabia. Question, if you're a prophet for Islam, why are you interested in defending synagogues? Yes, why? Synagogues are for Jews. Churches are for Christians. Monasteries are for monks. Why, O oh you, you the prophet of God, if you've come for the religion of Islam, surely you'd want to burn the churches. Surely you'd want to burn the synagogues. Yes. Surely you'd want to destroy all of them. Because a man who has come for God will surely recognize there is a plethora of opinions about God. Not one. Will recognize that our journeys to Allah are all different. Imam Amir al muminin used to say, the number of ways to God is the number of breaths you breathe. It's a wonderful line. Yes. 
The number of ways to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the number of breaths that you breathe. Some find God spiritually, some find God theologically, some find God ethically, some find God legally. If you ask any human being, how did you find God? One will say science. Science led me to God. Another will say no. I needed a barometer for ethics because when there's no God, everything goes. When there is a God, there is a barometer for our ethics, yes? In an atheist society, you tell me I'm doing something wrong, I'll be like, according to who? They'll be like, according to the majority. I said, give me 40 years, I'll change their mind. What was bad in America 45 years ago, today is cool in America, yes? What was bad in certain countries today is cool. Some will say that I found God spiritually. I had a spiritual moment in my life. I realized there's a God in my fitrah, yes, in my primordial nature. Rasulullah turned around and the Quran said that whenever we fight a war, it's to defend every Jew, every Christian, and every Muslim. Why? Because all of us are Ahlul Kitab. Notice what it, the translation of Ahlul Kitab is. If the Torah is a book, and the Bible is a book, and the Quran is a book, how many books does that make? Three. So why is it Ahlul Kitab and not Ahlul Kutub? Why is it people of the book, not people of the books? It's because Allah was saying, all your religions came from one original book. Yes, All of you are the sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam. If you differ with me, why do you differ? Did I say Ibrahim is anti-prophet? Did I call Jesus the antichrist? Do I not have a Quran that says what? The Quran says that there's a chapter called Maryam. Am I against Jesus? Secondly, he turned around to those Muslims who were living in Medina. He said to them, when they said to him, can we force our kids to be Muslim? This is fundamental. Can I force my child to be a Muslim? Say my child says, I want to be Jewish. I don't want to be Muslim. And the child is in a stage of adolescence. The child says, I want to be Jewish. Can I force them to become Muslim? The Quran revealed the verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La ikraha fiddin. There's no compulsion in religion. You cannot compel your child to become a Muslim. And that's why in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, usul al-Deen, you don't do taqlid in. You do taqlid in furu' al-Deen. Yes. Furu' al-Deen, I follow a marja, for example. Say, I follow Ayatollah Sistan. I follow him in my salah laws, psalm, hajj, zakat. In usul al-Deen, I don't follow a marja. Tawheed, I have to find God. I don't just imitate people. I myself must look for God, must understand prophethood, must know the proofs of imama, must know about the day of judgment and understand God's justice on that day. Therefore, you found the prophet said you cannot compel. Someone said, but Ya Rasulullah, you're the prophet of the religion of Islam. Surely you would want there to be a situation where everybody follows your religion. Not at all. That's not my concern. I have come not to compel. I've come to warn. Look what the Quran says. You are not a musaytar. You are a mundir. Yes. You cannot compel a human being to come and join this religion. What you can do is you can warn them. You can tell them about the day of judgment. You can tell them about your prophethood. And that's why the Quran said, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe can believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve can disbelieve. You cannot come to a person because he doesn't accept Islam. And say the law of the land says that you are someone who is now to be killed. Not at all. A person wants to be other than Islam. There's no problem. And that's why when the constitution of Medina was written. And sometimes, wallah, I wish. In the Palestine-Israel conflict that we see. Sometimes I wish. That people could return back. And look at the constitution of Medina at a time where the Jewish community, the Muslim community, the Christian community, type it on Google tonight, the constitution of Medina. Rasulullah would say the Jewish community worships in their synagogues, the Christian community in their churches, and the Muslim community in their mosques. If a Muslim insults a Jew, then he is to be punished by the state. And if a Muslim says anything rude to a Christian, he is to be punished in the state. And likewise, if there is a dispute the other way, it will come to me as the ultimate judge. Today when you see Jewish people and Muslim people in some communities, not all, but in some communities cannot get on with each other, you see that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, wanted to build a Medina, a Medina that may not necessarily recognize him as a prophet of God. 
but a Medina that recognized that we can all live together in peace and prosperity. But someone asked the question, and this is a fundamental question. What if someone doesn't believe in him as a prophet? They meet him, but they're not sure about him. Did he allow them to go back to their churches and worship? Look at the incident of Mubahala as the best of proofs. When the Christians came to talk to the Holy Prophet, they asked him, Oh Muhammad, let's ask you some questions. And look, this is the open-mindedness of Islam as Islam should have been. Michael Foucault used to say, an enlightened community is a critical community. Yes. If a community is critical, questions, is skeptical, that's not a negative, that's a positive. I don't want to follow a religion where if I ask a question, I get slapped. How many of you when you were younger? How many of you still have marks of slaps? Yes. You ask a question, show me God, slap. I want to ask a question about infallibility, slap. Can I ask about Imam Mahdi, slap. Okay, hold on a minute, this is a slapping session or a religion? The good thing in our generation, alhamdulillah, is that we're able to be a bit more critical than our elders. Our elders were asking the best questions, slapped. Whereas in our generation, alhamdulillah, the ethos of yes alunaka, please underline this line that I've said tonight. The ethos of yes alunaka, how many ayahs in the Quran begin yes alunaka, they ask you. Yes alunaka, an al ahilla. Yes alunaka, an al qarnayl. Yes alunaka, an al mahid. Yes alunaka, an al sa'a. Yes alunaka, an al ruh. Do you know how many ayahs in the Quran begin? They ask you, they question you, Muhammad, concerning. Do you know why? He didn't want to be a prophet who people follow blindly. Then you'll never have Iman through blind following. Yes? Iman comes through skepticism, questioning, critically questioning. And you know who keeps Islam backward? The ones who don't let you question. They're the ones who are a danger in our society. Nobody else. Those Mawlanas who tell you that don't question hijab. No, go ahead and question. I want you to question hijab. Critically question hijab. Ask, why do we wear hijab? What does hijab mean? What does khimar mean? What does jilbab mean? What's the difference between? Those of you who are uncertain about infallibility, question infallibility. It's not blasphemous. Blasphemy is when a government is scared of its structure, it starts to push the enemies away. Yes? There are those instances of blasphemy. If I today ask a question, for example, prove to me Imam Ali ibn Talib is the successor of Rasulullah. If the community says, how dare you, then that community is not an Islamic community. That's the culture, not the religion. The religion says, question everything. Anything you want, question. Naturally, I can't deny that there are certain things which are going to be leaps of faith. Even the Quran says, belief in the unseen is going to be a leap of, leap of faith. I, in no way, these eyes will no way see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as Imam al was asked by the person, show me God. What did he reply back to him? Look at the sun. The person turned around, looked at the sun, a few seconds later moved his eyes. Imam al said, what's wrong with you? He said, the rays of light were hurting me. He said, if you can't bear to see the created, how do you expect to see the creator? How are you expecting to see the creator? Yes. When you're telling me, show me God, we just about put a Manhattan skyscraper into your eye to prove to you the creation of the eye. Yes. It's that big, it could put a skyscraper inside you. That should be enough for you to realize this was not an accident. There is something miraculous about this, which only the doctors of the eye will tell you how miraculous it is. When Rasulullah came, the verses were revealed. Yes, Alunaka, question, question. A Muslim community will only grow through skepticism and questioning. And I want you to question everything. Why? If you, the parent, cannot answer your kids, then go and do some research about your religion quickly because your qabr and their qabr are two different qabrs. Yes? If you can't answer questions about the Quran or about the Ahlul Bayt, don't have Mawlana on call, yes? Sometimes you'll have someone dial a Mawlana. Yes. Straight away, Mawlana, there's this question. Why can't you yourself go and find the answer? Why can't you yourself find the knowledge? No problem, try and make time to sit. They came to Rasulullah, Muhammad, we asked you a question. Who's, Ya'qub's, who's Yusuf's father? He said, Ya'qub. Who's Musa's father? He said, Imran. He said, who's your father? He said, Abdullah. He said, who's Jesus' father? He said, he had no father. They said, then he must be the son of God. At that moment, if blasphemy was going to be applied, he would have told Ali ibn Abi Talib, behead all of them. Isn't that what our countries do? 
The moment a person, for example, says, I don't believe in Islam, I say Jesus is the son of God, straight away get a knife. Some of our countries, you find Saudi Arabia, a person questions the government, they say he's an atheist. How is questioning the government atheism? But I should be quiet about Saudi Arabia. I should be quiet. Because the irony of all ironies, the West attacks Islam and then makes the best relations with the very filth of Islam. And that's why you find in some parts of Saudi Arabia, the Awamiya area, Ahsa, Gatif, some of the followers of Al Muhammad, the way they're treated, it's unbelievable. And I'm banned from Hajj anyway. So even if I say, but who knows, maybe I could go again. Although Karbala is my Hajj. Now when you look at that therefore, they would ask Rasulullah, they asked him, asked him, asked him, asked him, they asked him. When at the end, Rasulullah said to them that I'll bring my sons, you bring your sons. I'll bring my woman, you bring your woman. I'll bring myself, you bring yourself. They were disturbed. They realized when they saw the nur on Al Muhammad. Yes, they saw the light of the faces of Al Muhammad. The Christian priest said, I will not enter the Mubahala. Why? Because the amount of light that shines from those five, if it tells the mountain to move, the mountain would move from its position. Yes, that there's no doubt. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Oh. Second louder salawat, inshallah. A third in honor of Imam Al-Kadhim, alayhi salam. After that, did Rasulullah say to them that you're blaspheming, heretical, leave? No. He said to them that like anyone else living in the Islamic State, you pay a tax, a jizya. Yes. The jizya is what? The jizya is that a couple of times in the year you give some money towards the poor. That's it. That's your tax. And that you continue to worship in your church. The fine line Rasulullah made in blasphemy was what? Freedom of speech is one thing. Freedom to insult is another. You as a Christian don't believe in me as a prophet of God. No problem. But don't insult me. You're living in an Islamic land. No problem whatsoever. Live as much as you want. Your church... You want to put Christ on the cross, even though our Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But no problem, you differ with the Quran, put the cross. But don't insult me, or don't insult the Muslim community. Why? Because there's a difference between the freedom of speech and freedom to insult. There are those who deserve freedom of speech. If you don't agree with Islam, write an academic article rejecting Islam. I don't mind, you're not insulting. You're using Islamic sources to reject Islam. But if you start making fun of the Prophet Muhammad, or making fun of Imam Ali, or making fun of Al Muhammad, let's say, purposely insulting them, there was one Iranian guy, I think he lives in Germany, started to make fun of Al Muhammad, the Imams, putting them in cartoons and laughing about them and so on. The question arose, what if the person lives outside the Islamic State? This Iranian was living, let's say, in Germany. He's not living in Iran. If he is living outside the Islamic State, let them be. Yes, let him do what he wants. He's living in a land where the law of the land says to insult is normal. Subhanallah. We live in a time where making fun of Jesus on the Simpsons is normal. Normal. Making fun of Musa in the Simpsons or in South Park or in other cartoons is normal. Making fun of Allah. They always bring poor Morgan Freeman's voice for Allah, don't they? <laughs> now, no doubt it's, it's a cool voice, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm sure his voice is something we cannot fathom. And Allah also knows who to use for his voices on the night of Mi'raj as well. But what you find is that they make fun. Now, when we say freedom of speech, we say talk about God, refute God. You're an atheist, I don't mind, refute God. I'm not going to say blasphemy against you. No, I believe you have every right to reject God if you sincerely looked for God and didn't use the hypocrisy of the religious as a reason to reject God. Yes. All of us, this speaker included, have seen how the religious can stab you in the back in many ways. Same ones who praise you, 
are the first to look for your downfall. But at the same time, you're more than welcome, no problem. But at the same time, we realize, don't insult God. Islam's law of blasphemy is, a person is free to speak, but not free to insult. Why not free to insult? I don't want to hear that there's a skirmish and there's gang fighting in my city. I want the city to live in peace. You're a Christian, practice in your church. You're an atheist, you don't believe in God. You don't need to spread leaflets saying God is nonsense, God is... No, say I don't believe in God, it's up to you. And there's many other countries you could go to where you don't have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone says, but there's a reference that Ka'ab, the son of Ashraf, was killed by Rasulullah. Or Abdullah, the son of Khatal, was killed by Rasulullah. Firstly, let me make something very clear. History was normally written by who? History of Rasulullah. I personally have a lot of problems with the seerah of Rasulullah. A lot of problems. Because the main writers of the seerah are who? Abu Huraira, Abdullah bin Umar, Aisha, and Anas bin Malik. Who? These are the four pillars. What do I call them? Pillars. These are the four pillars who told us how Prophet lived. Abu Huraira, Aisha, Abdullah bin Umar, and Anas bin Malik. I honestly have no interest in what they say whatsoever. If you took me to my grave right now, I will never, ever, 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 ever have interest in those four or what they say. Unless... It is in accordance with the seerah of Rasul from Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. I take how my Prophet lived from Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I take from Imam al Hassan, from Imam al Hussein, from Imam al Sajjar, Imam al Baqir, Imam al Sadiq. Why? Because there's no black dots on their reputation. Nothing. Every Muslim alive today has to love Al Muhammad. Do you agree? It's the miracle of Al Muhammad that in the year 2017, even those who had written books against Amir al Mu'mineen, removing his merits, not giving him his rights, until today, no Muslim can go to the grave except if they love Ali ibn Abi Talib. I take my seer of the Prophet not from Anas or Abu Huraira, and I have no interest. Let me make that very clear. Never in my life do I have an interest. Someone will say, but that's sectarian of you to say something like that. I'm not inflaming sectarianism. On the contrary, I'm making it clear that I'd rather have Al Muhammad's tongue speaking about their grandfather than anyone else speaking about their grandfather. Yes? They say that Rasulullah killed Ka'ab, son of Ashraf. Ka'ab, son of Ashraf, was a poet, a Jewish poet, belonging to Banu Nadir. They say because he was a Jewish poet, he had poetry which used to make fun of Rasulullah. Now I ask you, is that enough to kill someone if they have poetry? making fun of Rasulullah. One opinion is Rasulullah is the nur of Allah on earth, the light of Allah on earth. As a human being, if he is amongst you, you have no excuse, really. If you don't want to believe in him, then don't make fun of him. He used to write poets insulting Rasulullah. Did Rasulullah kill him for that reason? No. Rasulullah called Hassan bin Thabit. He said, Hassan, come next to me. Write a poem replying back to him. Yes. Jadilhum billati hiya nahsan. This man was killed if he was killed. And remember, this is the world of Anas and Abu Huraira, but we go with it. If he was killed, he was killed because of what reason? Treason against the state. Do you know, in the West, up until 20, 30 years ago, treason was killed by execution. It's an act which is punished by execution. If you help another country giving the secrets of your country, going behind the back, it's punishable. What did he do? Goes to Abu Sufyan, tells Abu Sufyan, listen, this is what Muhammad's doing. Enter Medina through here. Do this, do this, do this, and you'll kill him. That's treason against the state. I don't care which country in the world, you'll find that the countries will say, if a person's going to leak our secrets to another country, then that person is what? That person is to be executed according to the laws of the land. And that's not here. Britain, how much Britain is far ahead of everyone else. Up until 25 years ago, you can find parts of the European laws Treason against the state is executable. Someone says, how about Abdullah, the son of Khatan? Abdullah, son of Khatan, why? He was killed because he killed someone. Yes. In any country, you'll find that if you kill someone, if homicidal, manslaughter, there are different laws, there are different punishments. Some states will say what? They will say execute. 
Some states in America until today, electric chair. Other states, no, they will say prison. This person had killed someone. The narration mentions that the government decided that he was to be killed. Rasulullah did not kill anyone simply because they differed with him. If that person was in treason or had murdered someone, then that's a different story. Someone asks, what if the companions of Rasulullah, did any of them have the audacity to raise their voice? Because you know very well, if you're able to raise your voice with a man and the man does nothing to you, then you know that that man is not a dictator. Yes. But if the man, you raise your voice, imagine you raise your voice against Hajjaj bin Yusuf al-Thaqafi. Wallah, he'll eat you and drink you that night. Yes. And I literally say that. These are all cannibals. The son of Hind and the rest of the rubbish. All of them are what? They're all cannibals. Yes. Sayyidah Zainab says that, not me. Oh, you, who's who was born from the flesh of the martyrs. You were born from the flesh of the martyrs. Your grandmother chewed the liver of the noble. Islamic history is full of nonsense. And most of it is that Umayyad line. And the originator is the one who put them in power. Narrations mention what? That Rasulullah, did he kill anyone who differed with him? I'll give you an example. Hudaybiyah, the second Khalifa, differs with Rasulullah. Why are you making peace with the Quraysh? They used to be against us. We're more powerful than them. Let's kill them. Rasulullah said, no. Look in the books. Look in the books. He says to the Prophet, today I question his prophethood. Nothing happens to him. Worse than that with the incident of the pen and paper. Which in Google you will find clearly the calamity of Thursday. I love how people on the internet today are trying to defend everything possible to make sure that the two pillars, I've mentioned four, there's two other pillars, are all protected. Calamity of Thursday. What does it say? Rasulullah says, give me a pen and paper. I will write for you that way you will not go astray. The second Khalifa says to him, you are delirious. The Quran's enough. Tell me, a man who says... The law of blasphemy is that anyone who differs with me is to be beheaded. That man, what would he do to Umar at that time? He could turn around and say, kill him. No. Ibn Abbas says, Thursday, what a Thursday. He talks about how much he was crying, seeing the companions fight each other. Calling the Prophet Muhammad delirious. Did the Prophet Muhammad turn around and say, kill, behead? No. Prophet Muhammad said, listen, you have a difference of opinion with me, no problem. But don't even take it to the level of insults, cartoons, books where you make fun and you insult. And even he would tell his companions, what would he say? Do not abuse the idol. Subhanallah, the idol of the idol worshippers. That's why I remember in Bam, you know, there was the, the Buddha statue years back. And people came and bombed the Taliban, I think. They came and bombed this Buddha statue. Why? Why are you bombing it? Why the Buddhist community had built mosques a few hundred years earlier? What's wrong? Why are you bombing it? You found that they bombed it. Rasulullah said in the Quran, don't abuse the idols of the idol worshippers. For they'll turn around and abuse your Lord. <coughs> yes. If you're going to have this action, it's going to turn around to come back to haunt you. Therefore you found that Rasulullah made it clear. Blasphemy is a law where freedom of speech continues. But the freedom to insult, whether it's insulting Muslim leaders or insulting the leaders of other religions, should not be allowed in a country. Yes? And that's why you find, for example, today, how is blasphemy law being used? It's being abused, not used. SubhanAllah, it's being abused, not used. Today, people are using it in which way? They're saying, if you differ with my opinions, then we'll kill you. SubhanAllah, I'll never forget. You know, to be a marja, to be a marja, there are two books you have to study. Yes? Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiyya and the Sharh of Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiyya. Yes, the Damascan Glitterine. The author of the first book is who? Shaheed al-Awwal, the first martyr. Someone says, but his name is Al-Makki, for example. The author of the second one is called Shaheed al-Thani. Shaheed al-Thani, but he must have a name. No one mentions, for example, Zayn al-Din. They say Shaheed al-Awwal or Shaheed al-Thani. To be a marja, to be like Ayatollah Sistan and others, you have to finish al lum al damashqiyya And you have to finish Sharh al lum yes. Later on, of course, you'll find that new books came. Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani amongst others, my uncle, and others who have come with their different books to try and provide the newer books. But those two were called the first martyr and the second martyr. The first martyr and the second martyr, why? 
Because the government of the time used the abuse of blasphemy law to behead them. They said Shahid al awwal because he was such a grand scholar, but he was a Shia scholar. A Maliki scholar, jealous of his position, said, this guy is a Shia. He rejects Abu Bakr and Umar, gets him, they beheaded him, killed him. Hold on, if I differ with you about Abu Bakr and Umar, how does that make me leave Islam? This is a very, I want everyone please to focus on this very sensitive point. Someone says to me, you have to be Sunni. I say, okay. If I love Allah, am I Sunni? Yes. If I love Rasul Allah, am I Sunni? Yes. If I love Al Muhammad, am I Sunni? Yes. What if I reject the main Khulafa? Do I still become, am I still Sunni or no? Since when did the Khulafa become part of the Aqaid of Ahlul Sunnah? You tell me Imam came after Rasulullah. How could it be part of Aqidah? But then when I reject the Khulafa, you tell me I'm out of the fold of the religion of Islam. As the Khulafa came after Rasulullah. You tell me Imam came after Rasulullah. If it came after Rasulullah, how comes now? I say I reject the Khulafa. And I say this without trying to cause tension. I say this purely as an argument. Because Shahid al awwal if he has a difference with the Khulafa, Khulafa non masumin yes. If I have a difference of opinion with the Khulafa, that difference of opinion with the Khulafa, what do you find? You find that Shahid al awwal would himself say, okay, I've got a different historical opinion, they beheaded him. Shahid al thani because he didn't want this judge to write an intro to his book, they made a rumor in Syria. Shahid al thani rejects Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmed bin Hanbal. They took him and killed him. Why? They said they are blasphemous. How are they blasphemous? Does he not believe in Allah? Yes. Does he not believe in Rasulullah? Yes. Does he not believe in the Quran? Yes. They began to use blasphemy, not to defend the peace, but to defend their pockets and their power. And when Islam becomes a religion, where people use the law of blasphemy to protect their seeds, Assalam ala al-Islam. That's the end of the religion of Islam, I tell you. That's the end of the religion of Islam. Hujr bin Adi al-Kindi. Many of you have been ziyara to Sayyidah Zainab. You would have gone half an hour away. Marj Adra, Hujr bin Adi al-Kindi. Many of you would have read my book, Hujr bin Adi, a victim of terror. Even if you haven't, I had to plug that in there. Hujr bin Adi al-Kindi. How much I used to love going to his ziyara. Hujr bin Adi. As in when I wrote my book, The Victim of Terror, Hujr bin Adi. It's because this was one of the most loyal companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen. You know how Muawiyah got him killed? You see, Muawiyah... Every Friday, they would order, do la'na on Ali ibn Abi Talib, every Friday. I'm coming to this lecture soon, by the way. It's coming. I haven't even gone to those gears yet. I'm coming. Say that, do la'na on Ali ibn Abi Talib, do la'na on Ali ibn Abi Talib, do la'na on him. Every Friday, every Friday. And they say, you Shia, why do you do la'na? When you started the rubbish. Don't let me open the books. It's going to be a long number of years of books which we're going to open. If God gives us the life. Hujr stood up. Muawiyah, who did he have? Subhanallah, look at who Muawiyah's governors are. Mughira bin Shu'ba. The scum of history. And who? Ziyad bin Abi. You know what his name is in English? Ziyad, son of his dad. The, the history that we have. <laughs> Wallah, some of you may laugh. We lost blood because of these. You can laugh. We lost blood. You know who's his son? Abaydullah bin Ziyad bin Abi, Mughira bin Shu'ba, Governor Basra, Governor Kufa. They begin the Friday prayer. God curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. Hujr stood up. He said, "What are you doing?" He said to him, who are you to speak? He said, I'll speak. You don't curse my mawla in front of me. The letter reached Muawiyah and Sham. When the letter reached Muawiyah and Sham, Muawiyah said, very well. Then spread the news. What, what news do you want to spread? Hujr insulted God. How did he insult God? He stood up. No, spread the news. Say he insulted God. We'll send a mob after him. Law of blasphemy abused. When see our countries abuse it, that's where it began. Hujr bin Adi, they come try to arrest him. Why? What have I done wrong? You cursed Allah. 
I stood up against the cursing of Ali. No, you cursed Allah. And the news has spread. And now you are to be caught. Eventually they caught him where? Near Sayyidah Zainab's shrine. They caught him over there. The very place he had conquered when he was younger. Muawiyah looked at him. He said to him, you cursed God. He said, I didn't. He said, I stood up against you and the rest of you who cursed my master. He said, leave your master. I'll be with you. I'll let you go. He said, I'll never leave my master. What do you make me fear? Death? You think that I'm scared of you killing me? I die on the love of my master as an honor for me. He said to him, what's your final wish before you die? You're an Arab. What's your final wish? He said, behead my son. He said, sorry. He said, behead my son. You're going to kill me? You give me the Arab final wish? Behead my son. They said to him, are you sure? He said, behead my son. They come with the sword, behead his son. His son smiles as he's dying. Hajar smiles. Muawiyah asks, why? What's the issue? What made you behead your son? He said, I'm in so much peace now. He said, why? He said, I feared that if I die before my son, my son may leave the love of Ali and join your love. I saw my son die loving Ali ibn Abi Talib. What an honor it is for me to be beheaded now. I can come to the day of judgment. And I could say I raised a boy who loved Amir al-Mu'mineen. Yes. Now, here's my neck. Take it. And I'll meet you and your father and all of you on the day of judgment with all these chains on my hands. Why do you think these Salafis try to destroy his grave? Because they know that's a symbol of Ali's lovers. They try to destroy and they dug and they dug and they dug and you can keep digging from now till the day of judgment. We'll still win every war, even though we're 20%. Yes, we'll still win. Put us anywhere in the Middle East. You bought all your billion petrol dollars and we won and won and won and we keep winning. You found that that's what they did. They abused the law. Blasphemy, that man did not care. You abuse the law. You say, I cursed Allah. Meet me and Allah on day of judgment. Let's see, O son of Umayyah, what you'll be able to do then. And that's why, subhanAllah, the same way Ziyad and Mughira spread this blasphemy against Hujr, you found Ibn Ziyad and Yazid done it against Imam al Hussein. SubhanAllah. You know what they said about Imam al Hussein? The person has left the religion of Islam. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because the person has blasphemed. How, what's he blasphemed? Imam al Hussein does not believe in Allah. Or Dua Arafah is the greatest way to talk to Allah. Those of you who've been to Karbala or Hajj on the day of Arafah, I ask you, is there a Dua like Dua Arafah of Imam Al-Hussein? The only Dua like it is the Dua Arafah of Imam Zain Al-Abidin. Both of them have wonderful Duas on the day of Arafah. Tell me, Imam Al-Hussein, when you made a statement in Sham, Yazid said, Hussein, son of Ali, has blasphemed God. He is to be beheaded. Where? Medina. Imam left Medina. Mecca, you cannot kill a mosquito if it comes on your hand in Hajj. He said, behead Hussein next to the Kaaba. You know who stood on top of the Kaaba? Abel Fadl. They were going to come and kill Imam al-Hussein. He looked at all of them. He said, I hear you want to kill my brother. said, I hear you want to kill my brother. They said, yes, we want to kill your brother. I said, okay. He said, let me tell you something. For all those who think they're going to kill my brother. He said, that why do you want to follow a man who gives you the drink of alcohol when you can follow the man who quenches your thirst from the pool of Kothar? Then he says, you scare my brother and me with death. As kids, we used to play with death. He said, if any of you think you're going to get to my brother, you have to go through me first. If you can get past me, that's the only way you'll get through to my brother. They wanted to kill him in Medina. And that's why those who tell you Shia of Iraq killed Imam al-Hussein, they always say the Shia of Kufa killed Imam al-Hussein. Where was Mecca and Medina? Where's Mecca and Medina? They made the grandson of Rasulullah leave without one of them helping him. You're saying the people of Kufa killed him? Where's Abdullah bin Umar? Where's Sahel bin Sa'ad? Where's Zayd bin Arqam? Where's the rest of the Sahaba alive? All quiet. 
You hear blasphemy. He said that the grandson, the very man whose granddad you mentioned in Salah is a blasphemer. And he gets towards Kufa, Muslim bin Aqil. When he gets towards Kufa, what does Shuraih al Qadi do? Or the Qadi Shuraih? Make a statement. Other judges make a statement. Muslim bin Aqil, blasphemy. How is he blasphemy? He has not given bay'ah to the Khalifa. That's blasphemy. Hold on. I thought blasphemy was not believing in God, cursing God. No, now the Khalifa is also a connection to God. The tool of the government is blasphemy. Muslim bin Aqil, beheaded. Hani bin Arwa, beheaded. One by one. They were calling blasphemy, blasphemy. Until the final insult, Shimar bin Dil Joshan, Umar bin Sa'ad, on the 10th of Muharram, calling out what? That all this opposition are all blasphemers. Say, why? Do they not believe in Allah? They believe in Allah. Do they not believe in Rasulullah? He is their granddad, for goodness sake. Do they not believe in the Qur'an? The walking Qur'an is in front of you. Yes. What else do you want? You find that the narrations mention that at that moment they said, but you people reject Yazid, therefore you people are to be killed. Said, how about the children? They said, we'll kill all of your children one by one. And someone asks the question, oh, Hussein, why did you take those children? Yes. And the answer is, had only elders been killed, people would not shed a tear. But when a six-month-old baby dies, it breaks. Yes, it breaks the heart. That radi' in the hand of Rabab. Yes. Tell me that radi' Imam al Hussein asked them, radi' is a blasphemer? What crime has the baby done? You tell me, which crime? Answer me. Did he say there's no God? Did he say there's no prophet? It's a baby for goodness sake. And how does he turn to Rabab? She asks him, Aba Abdullah, I want to ask you, why did you go back and forth, Allahu Akbar, seven times? <laughs> yes, I, leave I leave this with this you, with you oh, lovers oh lovers of Karbala. Of Karbala. Why did why you go did back and forth back seven, back seven times? Time, time, time. And, the and the narration mentions, he says, Rabab, Rabab, I don't know, I don't how, know to how to tell a mother, mother. mother. An, arrow an arrow has pierced her baby. Which other Which kids? Other kids? The, slap the slap on Ruqayya's cheeks. Oh, Allah. 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 The slap on Ruqayya's cheeks. And what does she what call does she out? out? She calls out, show, show me Najaf. Why? She said, I want to complain, I wanna complain to, to my grandfather. Look what Look they've what done, they done to the children. Allahu Akbar. May Allah bless May Allah all of your tears. Look, Look at that. And other and children, other Hassan al Muthanna, young son, son of Imam al Hassan, 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 pushed off. Pushed off. Others, others hit. Others, 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 others. But the two others, flowers of Zainab break, break your heart your tonight. tonight. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Take, your Take your heart to Sham, sham tonight. Awn al Muhammad, the flowers of Zainab's heart. Allahu Akbar. Awn al Muhammad, the flowers of Zainab. You found that these two, the night of the 10th, she looked, she looked at both of them in the eyes. Those who have a relation with Sayyidah Zainab, this is for you. Those of you who have a relation with Sayyidah Zainab, this is for you. I don't need to say anything. All I know is she's alone in Sham and we All I know is even after she died, it's as if still Karbala is with her. Night of the tent, she looks at both of them in the eyes. She said, are you going to make me proud tomorrow? They said to her, mom, of course we'll make you proud. She said, so you're going to go to your father and you're going to say to him that you're going to fight alongside, it's your uncle, you're going to say to him, you're going to fight alongside. She said, mom, it's our honor. honor. And she hugged them, but she wouldn't cry. She didn't want to break up Abdullah's <laughs> heart. And the narrations mentioned that once the companions have all died, she knew Layla was getting Akbar ready and Ramla is getting Qasim ready. Rabab did not know who she was getting. And she came towards both of them. She said, are you both ready? She said, mom, we're ready. They came to their uncle. And these two young boys, yes, they came to their uncle. They said, uncle, we're ready to defend you. 
Hey, said to them, my two darlings, go back to the tent. You protect your mother. I want you to look after your mother in Kufa and in Sham. He knew there'd be a time they'll slap Zainab one day. They'll rip the hijab of Zainab from her. Hind, the wife of Yazid, says, I didn't recognize Zainab. Allahu Akbar. They came back to the tent and said that Zainab was not expecting them back. She said, why are you here? At that moment, they said, our uncle said, you have to protect your mom. <laughs> said your uncle said, you have to protect your mom. She came out towards him. She knew that he that for her, she was his soft spot. He remembers her tears when her mother Fatima died. It broke him. He's the one who would stop her crying when Imam Al Hassan was poisoned. She said to him, "You have to let them go." He said, "No, I can't." She said, "How do you expect me to face my mother, not having given anything to you?" She knew the mention of his mom breaks him. And he let them go out. And you know while they were going out, you know what they said? They said, uncle, don't worry. He said to them, why? They said, uncle, why would you worry about us? One of our grandfathers is Ali ibn Abi Talib. The other is Ja'far al -Tayyar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. The narrations mention that they went out and they fought valiantly, uh, one defending the other, standing alongside each other. The moment a person attacked Aun, Muhammad would defend him. And the moment a person attacked Muhammad, Aun would defend him. Every time they turn around, they look for their uncle of Al Fadl al Abbas, calling out, Uncle Abbas, are you proud? <laughs> but while they'd look at Abel Fadla, there'd be a tear coming down from their eye. Why? Because they knew they wouldn't be able to defend Abel Fadl when he'd be alone. <laughs> Uh, all of a sudden, Omar bin Sa'ad called out, uh, go and attack the two of them, surround them all together. Uh, one man came, he struck on, uh, Muhammad jumped on his body and took the blow. Uh, and then another came and attacked Muhammad. Uh, he called out, As-salamu alaykum. <laughs> Imam al Hussein came running out. One of them remained alive for those short moments. Imam al Hussein looked towards his eyes. He looked towards Abu Abdullah. He said to him, Oh, my uncle, are you proud of the two of us? He said to him, My apple of my eye, of course I'm proud of you. Then he said, Oh, my uncle, send a message to my mother Zainab. What does he want to say? Tell my mother I never drank any of the water of the Farad. <laughs> How can I drink from the water while my uncle Abu Abdullah is thirsty with the water? Both of them, he took them both back with him. God help us understand how did Abu Abdullah carry the two of them? He took them back into the tent. Their mother Zainab stood there, no tears coming from her eyes. Why? She didn't want to break the heart of Imam al Hussein. When they went to Kufa, she didn't cry for them. When they went to Sham, she didn't cry for them. When they came back to Karbala, she didn't cry for them. When she entered Medina, she entered her house. She saw two empty mattresses on the ground. Where's my own and where's my Muhammad? Where are the flowers of my eye? I would have cried for the two of you. But I never wanted to break the heart of Abu Abdullah. I would have cried for both of you. But I wanted someone to cry for Abu Abdullah. <laughs> 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 
إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. With these tears, ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allow us to be amongst his protectors and those who follow his message and protect the message of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these tears. Make sure you are asking your private hajat. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Allahumma inni as'aluka. But the tawajjuh through Al Muhammad. Question to Allah, tawajjuh. Those who have exams, those who have kids who are not married. Those of you who know people who are not feeling well, those of you who know people you have not seen for years, ask in the name of the tear for Zainab and the children of Zainab. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a surah al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawah.